side of the screen and they are not having the high TV. Uh, for the online participants, I think we'll take a couple of more minutes before we start. Uh, participants are slowly clicking in. Okay, so good morning once again, everyone, and welcome to another special session of the ASI. Right, just after the inauguration and after a wonderful high tea, we have our award ceremony. And as you know, ASI gives out a few awards every year. This time also, we have our fair share. So let's get started with that. Uh, just give me a moment while I get my slides to move. So the first award to be presented is the ASI Women in Bhavi Award. Let me first say a few words about the award itself. Zubin Kimbhavi, 35 years of age, is the younger son of Major Raji and Sasmita Kimbhavi. He has a brother and three cousins who are all at the top of their chosen professions. Zubin is probably the most gifted amongst the five, but because of his extreme physical disability, he has not been able to translate his gifts to achievements. He spends time listening to music, in contemplation, and on occasional long drives, his father and brother take him on. Take him on. He has been attending a special school, which he likes very much and has adapted remarkably well to online sessions made necessary by the pandemic. Ajit and Asha Kimbhavi set up the ASI Women Kimbhavi Award as a tribute to him. The Astronomical Society of India has instituted the Women Kimbhavi Award funded by Ajit and Asha Kimbhavi. The objective is to promote one, observational and instrumentation work in astronomy and allied fields, and two, public outreach and education in astronomy and allied fields. This award was set up in 2018 and alternate between the two fields I just mentioned. The 2021 Women Zimbabwe Award is being given for observational and instrumentation, instrumentation work in astronomy and the light fields. For the year 2021, the ASI Women Zimbabwe Award goes to Team Astrosat. Let me read the citation from the committee. Yeah. The ASI Zubin Kimbavi Award for Observational and Instrumentation Work in Astronomy and Allied Fields for 2021 is awarded to Team Astrosat for the successful design, build, launch, and operations of India's first multivalent space observatory, Astrosat. The Astrosat development team has led a significant piece of work to develop a satellite that operates in the UV and X-ray regimes. The satellite is complementary to the SWIFT, XMM Newton, and Hubble Space Telescope satellites' capabilities, but extends coverage into the far east. 
at the UV wavelengths, the AstroSat operates at similar wavelengths as, as GALAX, but at four times better spatial resolution as compared to GALAX. AstroSat has produced 156 publications covering a range of scientific topics, including several highly cited scientific results that make use of the satellite. The instrument clearly has made an impact on the astronomical community, and the team should be commended for enabling these scientific results. In addition to the scientific and technological impact AstroSat has already produced at the international level, it has also enabled a change in the mindset of Indian and international astronomical community regarding India's contribution to modern astronomy. The scientific impact is not restricted to just one narrow field and instead covers a wide range of astronomical topics. Uh, something I have been remiss at, I must have invited uh, our president, Professor Anupama, to be here on the stage. And shortly afterwards, I invite members of Team AstroSat, Dr. Sita and Professor K.P. Singh, to join us on the stage and receive the award on behalf of the AstroSat team. Uh, Professor P.C. Agrawal, uh, who is an integral member and a leading member of the AstroSat team, he wanted to say a few words. We we'll just tried to find him on Zoom, and if that works out, we'll pass the stage to him for a few minutes. Okay, while we are connecting to Professor Agarwal, um, we accept this award on the behalf of the entire AstroSat team. It's a huge team. Uh, all of them are not able to come here with us today. I first wish to thank Asha and Ajit Kimbhavi for instituting this award specifically for instrumentation and observation. Um, this gives the much needed inspiration for the younger members to actually get involved in instrumentation in astronomy, which is rather difficult and also long drawn. People spend sometimes at least half of their careers or sometimes their whole career on a single instrument. So uh, thanks for this award. Um, I, our sincere thanks also to ASI for choosing to confer this award on Team AstroSat. Uh, coming from the astronomy community, this award is a great honor for all of us. And uh, so are you able to get him? No. Okay. So um, um, I wish to also thank all the members of AstroSat who made this possible, starting from designing, development, testing, evaluation of the five prime instruments, the satellite, the ground segment, and also the observers who are actually using the satellite to make scientific contributions. Uh, uh, the team AstroSat has decided that uh, the award my prize money would be contributed to the ASI Corpus Fund to institute an AstroSat prize, which will be given at every ASI. We will work out the details with the EC and uh, looking forward to many, many more observations and publications 
and new science results from AstraZeneca. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Sita. And indeed, it's a pleasure for the ASI to confer this award on Team AstroSat. It's very well deserved. That was a unanimous opinion of the committee as well. Uh, if I could go back to my slides. Yeah. So, like Dr. Sita said, Team AstroSat is big and diverse, and they don't have a team picture, but what they do have is the satellite itself. Yeah. Uh, can we move to the next? Okay. So here is the last view of the AstroSat before it was launched. And uh, here is the, the CAD diagram identifying all the various uh, payloads up on AstroSat. And with that, we move on to the next award, which, we, uh, which ASI will be giving out today. And that is the Justice Oak Award for outstanding thesis in astronomy and astrophysics. The society gives the Justice B. G. Oak Award for outstanding PhD thesis in astronomy by a student affiliated to an Indian institution. The objective of the award is to encourage excellence amongst research students in India, and the award is given on the adjudication by a committee appointed by the ASI. This award was instituted in the year 2002. For the year 2021, the Justice Oak Award for Outstanding Thesis is being given to Dr. Swagat Mishra. And I'll read out the citation for him. Dr. Swagat Saurabh Mishra, who performed his PhD research at the Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, is being awarded the Astronomical Society of India's Justice Oak Award for the best thesis of 2021 for his outstanding and varied contributions to cosmology, ranging from the early history of the universe to dark energy. So Dr. Mishra is not in the country. He is uh, working on his postdoctoral position in the University of Nottingham in the UK. So he's not able to join us to receive the award, but we will shortly have a presentation uh, from him, which he will be presenting online. This year, the committee had uh, a large pool of excellent theses from which to select uh, the winner. And they had a really tough time. And they also recommended two honorable mentions. So I will go to them next. So the first of these, uh, ASI Justice Oak Award Honorable Mention for the Outstanding Thesis for the year 2021 goes to Dr. Anshu Kumari. Dr. Anshu Kumari performed her PhD thesis research at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics and is being acknowledged for her unique contributions to the development of a solar radio spectropolarimeter and utilizing this instrument to constrain the elusive solar coronal magnetic field associated with solar radio bursts. Dr. Anshu Kumari is also in Helsinki at the moment at the University of Helsinki and is uh, unable to accept this award in person. And it shall be given to a representative who uh, she has asked it to be passed on. The other honorable mention uh, goes to Dr. Shurajit Mandal. Dr. Shurajit Mandal, who performs his PhD thesis research at the National Center for Radio Astronomy, is being acknowledged for his pioneering contributions to the development of a highly versatile interferometric solar imaging pipeline and for intelligent use of radio observations to constrain solar energetic phenomena from small to large scales. Dr. Mandel, unfortunately, is also not in the country. He's at the New Jersey Institute of Technology pursuing his postdoctoral fellowship, and his award would be sent to his home. Uh, and that brings us to the end of this uh, award distribution function, per se. And now it's the time. So let's. And uh, we can now move on to the first of the award talks, which is going to be delivered uh, by Dr. Sita on behalf of Team AstroSat. Yeah. Good afternoon to all of you. It's a great pleasure. I, I, I will try to present a glimpse of the 
capabilities of the instruments on SSR and the observation, the variety of observations which this first Indian Space Observatory has conducted. Um, so let me start with uh, how we started. As you are all aware, uh, space astronomy in India started with balloon and rocket experiments in uh, 1960s. Uh, later, we went on to having piggyback experiments on Indian satellites within, on, flown on Indian launch vehicles. Um, the Indian X-ray astronomy experiment on IRSP-3 was one of the piggyback experiments, very important because this was the experiment with which we pointed to individual sources in the sky from using an Indian satellite. Um, based on its uh, success, uh, Professor Agarwal and the team members proposed to, proposed to ISRO that we should have a dedicated astronomy mission. And uh, ISRO in turn formed two working groups, one led by Professor P.C. Agarwal for the X-ray and gamma ray astronomy, and the other led by N. Kameshwar Rao for optical, infrared, and UV astronomy. And they were expected to come up with reports which would give details of what instrumentation should be carried on this dedicated mission and would yet have a niche area which would be addressed by this particular mission as compared to the ongoing and planned international missions. So finally, the project was approved into 2004. Uh, uh, the, the scientific objectives of this uh, satellite were worked out as follows. It was primarily for high resolution timing and spectral studies of X-ray emitting objects on one hand and very high resolution imaging of large fields of view in UV on the other hand. And combining these two capabilities to study broad, broadband spectral measurements so that you could actually get down to um, both studying both individual objects and extended objects like the galaxies and so on. Uh, based on these scientific objectives, five main payloads and a charged particle monitor were proposed. Uh, the first instrument, I go in the order of the of, uh, wavelength coverage. Uh, so the first instrument is the, not the wavelength coverage actually, it is the energy from lowest to highest energy coverage. Um, the ultraviolet imaging telescope, UV, um, this was meant to image the sky in both FUV and NUV wave bands, along with a visible camera also. The details of the calibration are given in the two references are listed and the references listed in these two publications. Um, the lead institution was the Indian Institute of Astrophysics and in collaboration with IUPA and the Canadian Space Agency. And of course, ISRO was a collaborator in all the instrumentation. The uh, optics itself consisted of twin Ritchie criteria, two mirror systems, one covering the near UV and the optical and the other covering the FUV. The intensified CMOS system in photon counting mode was the detector used. The visible channel is actually used for drift correction. Um, the main uh, capability of this instrument is the 1.8 arc seconds goal over a large field of view of nearly half a degree. Uh, to compare, uh, it is about four times better resolution than the GALAX which was flown earlier than this. The present status is that the FUV and the WIS channels are operating with the same sensitivity as after launch. However, the 
NUV channel is at present not operating because of some electronic issues. Um, then we have the soft X-ray telescope. Um, the soft X-ray telescope is meant to measure the X-ray spectrum, image, and do variability studies in the soft X-ray energies, that is the lower X-ray energies from 0.3 to 8 kV range. Uh, this is primarily developed by the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, along with University of Leicester, UK. Uh, both these are the prime imaging instruments on uh, Astrosat, and uh, uh, the UVIT optics was developed by the Laboratory of Electro Optics Systems of ISRO, and the uh, optics of the soft X ray telescope was developed indigenously by PASO for the first time. Uh, this is a thin conical foil uh, volta approximation. It consists of aluminium foil mirrors coated with gold. And uh, there are about 320 mirrors in all. It's a combination of paraboloid, hyperboloid mirror systems, 40 shells in all. This is again a wide field um, uh, um, view of 40 arc minutes, and it has an image resolution of few arc minutes. Uh, the present status, it is operating with the same sensitivity as it was after launch. Uh, the next major um, instrument, again developed by Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, is the large area X-ray proportional counters three numbers in all. Um, these are meant for extending the X-ray spectrum and uh, not imaging, but actually um, constricting the field of view in a narrow, narrow field of view of one degree. And, uh, and the variability studies in three to 80 K. The, References give the color, calibration results. After launch, we achieved um, 6,000 square centimeter effective area and all the three lux species at 20 kV. It is about three or four times better than the comparable RXT instrument, which was um, launched before this in 1996. Um, this instrument actually extends the energy range over a wide range of 3 to 80 kV. And you can see there is an overlap from 3 to 8 kV with the soft X-ray telescope. Um, the present status is the lax PC2 is what operational, lax PC1 is at operating at a reduced gain, and lax PC3 is non-operational. The next instrument is the cadmium zinc telluride. Imager, it is meant for variability, polarization, and spectral studies in 20 to 100 kV energy range. Above 100 kV, this instrument actually becomes an open field of view. And so it is used to actually detect gamma ray bursts, which comes from any directions in the sky. The cadmium zinc telluride is a solid state detector and um, it is uh, qualified for spaceworthiness for this particular instrument. Um, it has a passive collimator and uh, it is operational after launch along with a charge particle monitor um, as it was immediately after launch. The sensitivity remains the same. Uh, then the fifth instrument is the scanning sky monitor. It was meant to the detect uh, the X-ray transient and study the variability in the X-ray transients. And it operates in the 2.5 to 10 kV energy range. It's a position sensitive gas field counter again. And it scans, it, it is mounted on a rotating platform. It is developed by the UR Rao Satellite Center at the Bangalore. Um, it scans the sky, uh, it does a rotation in a step and stair mode over zero to five degrees 
to the 55 degrees and then back again. So clockwise and anti-clockwise. Right now, one of the counters is operational. Uh, about the overall astrosat, this is the first dedicated multi-wavelength observational satellite, dedicated astronomy satellite from ISRO, and it is being operated as a space observatory. We receive proposals from all over the world, and the operation of the satellite is done based on the targets which are proposed in the proposals for scientific observation. Um, it's a collaboration of ISRO and several science institutes that you saw, which developed the instruments. The launch was on 28 September 2015. It has already completed six years. The design life was for five years operation. It is in a 650 kilometer orbit with a six degree inclination launched by the PSLV launch vehicle, the first near Earth equatorial launch for the satellite. Some of the important parameters which you have to consider for this spe specific mission is that we are transmitting photon counting data directly uh, down to ground so that that enables us to filter the data for various scientific purposes as I will elaborate in the data. Then a uh, door opening mechanism for the optics, both UV and SXT, filter wheel movement mechanisms, gas purification mechanisms for lax PC, and so on and so forth. The thermal control was very strict. Contamination control for the UV instrument was very strict. And so these were the new developments which, 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 uh, which we undertook for the software. I now go on to uh, tell about, uh, please let me know the time when I have 10 minutes, uh, about some of the observations which we made. Uh, this is an observation, sorry. This is an observation of, uh, of uh, M, what was thought to be a uh, nondescript M giant star. But with the UVIT uh, observations in a great thing, UVIT usually uses the five filters which we use for imaging, but it also has a grating in both the NUV and FUV channel. Based on the FUV grating, we have measured the spectrum of this uh, star, and it is now confirmed to be a symbiotic system with a white dwarf rather than a M giant star. Um, then we have observed some flaring star systems. This is an M system, M type system, uh, which showed three flares in quick succession. And um, we have studied this using the soft X-ray telescope. And uh, another um, flaring system is the Proxima Centauri, which has been studied along with uh, the Chandra telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope. Incidentally, EQPEG was also observed with the ground-based facilities in India. Um, Proxima, uh, the observations of Proxima Centauri are particularly relevant because we want to know how the flares on the star affects the planetary system and the habitability of the planetary system in such uh, stars. Um, next. Um, Going on to globular clusters, um, we have observed several globular clusters and uh, this demonstrates actually the uh, capability of the UV instruments compared to galaxies. We can resolve many of these stars as individual stars now, uh, both on the outer periphery and also in the internal. Uh, part of the globular cluster. And um, you can see this even better in this black and white picture for the NGC 7492. Um, there are variations also with the NUV picture and the SUV picture because the red dust stars are, of course, uh, not seen in the SUV image. And we can see many, many more individual stars in the SUV image. Uh, so, several such uh, uh, globular clusters have been studied and um, 
the horizontal branch has been demarcated into red red horizontal branch blue horizontal branch and extreme horizontal branch etc very very separately and now in fact individual stars in these globular clusters are being studied ehp4 is one such example which is found to be a binary of a um, blue straggler stars along with a hotter companion blue straggler stars are very very important because uh, they are blue stars which don't follow along with the sequence as the sequence in clusters evolve away from the hr diagram so how are these blue straggler stars formed and how will they evolve is a question which is being addressed uh, using the uwit we have been able to add very crucial uv points using the uv filters on the uv end of this overall spectrum so this overall spectrum is, uh, is constructed using several data sets from various observatories as you can see here covering all the way from infrared or and optical and of course uv from galaxy also uh, but if you fit just these part this part of the spectrum you might think it is a single blue straggler star however when you fit also the uv part then you find that there is a uv axis which can be fit only with a companion which is much hotter and many times this companion happens to be a white dwarf and in some cases an extremely low mass white dwarf with masses less than um, less than 0.2 solar masses and so the evolution path of some of these stars in both globular clusters and open clusters are being put together in an evolutionary diagram uh, going on to other white dwarf systems uh, we have also imaged planetary nebulae Uh, planetary nebula actually shows halos around. I don't know if you can see this golden halo around the planetary nebula in FUV, which is much extended compared to the central planetary nebula system in optical. Similar is the case in this case. You you see the lobes extending uh, far from the central system, and we also see jets. and these are being studied much more in detail with hst images uh we have also st studied a white dwarf recurrent nova which are, which uh, nova outburst occurs once in 29 years or so and we caught this nova uh, in just as it was emerging in, the, in its super soft state this is the energy and this is the number of days Starting from eight days or so around eight point six days, becomes we are able to see the super soft state, and we are able to see also the variation in that state. Um, coming to neutron star binaries, um, we are able to actually see the spin period of several neutron star binaries as a function of energy. So you can see right from point three kV all the way to eighty kV. how the spin profile is over different energy bands and we are also able to study phase result studies based on for these systems several of these systems uh, this is a um, uh, neutron star binary which is uh, confirmed to be uh, ultra luminous x-ray source based on the measured flux from astrosat and it's a 9.2 second rotation period we also studied some cyclotron features of some of these high mass x-ray binaries several of them are listed here this is very important to study the magnetic field of these neutron star systems uh coming to other neutron star binaries we have also studied um thermonuclear bursts from these systems uh in fact kilohertz qpos evolving with time from around 815 hertz to 840 hertz over a span of within about an hour very very rapid thermonuclear burst happening within a matter of few 
and few tens of minutes, within 12 minutes or so, uh, in rapid succession. And of course, uh, also burst oscillations are observed in both these systems. Uh, broadband spectra is one more, I'll just take a few more minutes. Broadband spectra is one more capability, as I said, combining both the soft X-ray and the hard X-ray. And for black hole binaries and neutron star binaries, we can study them as a function of their state as they evolve in their state. Uh, some of this, for example, the 1630 minus 47 is a transient black hole binary system. We have used the spectra to actually estimate the spin parameter of this black hole system, which happens to be around 0.92. Uh, the, the, some, in some of the systems, the, uh, the spectrum we can extend all the way from 0.3 keV to about 70 keV. Uh, coming to the black hole system, GRS 1950, which is a favorite amongst many, we have QPOs in few hertz range and also all the way to 70 hertz range in the different variability classes. It has 14 variability classes. We have studied several of them and we find that the QPO varies with time. This is the QPO frequency varies with time. And uh, the QPO frequency variation can be modeled as a function of not only the, um, the radius of the accretion disk, but the radius of the accretion disk does not depend only on the QPO frequency but it also depends on the accretion rate. Uh, combined, we can estimate what is the inner radius and therefore the spin parameter. Um, coming to galaxies, several um, spiral galaxies, including NGC 2336 have been found. Star forming knots have been identified, almost 72 knots. We also studied mergers, galaxy mergers, and we've identified star forming knots even in the tidal tails of this particular merger which is 7252 called the atoms for peace galaxy and we've studied the central part where we find there is probably AGN feedback operating for the star formation in the central regions and um, and also to inhibit star formation in the outer regions shown, the inhibition is shown in the red portion. Um, we also discovered a slumpy galaxy, which emits extreme UV, which is red shifted, and we detect it in the FUV uh, filter of UVIT. And the Lyman continuum is detected in the NUV part of the UVIT, and it falls in the red shift desert of 0.5 to 2.5. And so this becomes the first such galaxy from which Lyman continuum has been detected in this uh, desert region of uh, uh, Lyman continuum uh, emission. Um, we have also studied star formation in dwarf galaxies. Um, let me go on a little bit quickly. I'll just take a few more minutes. Active galactic nuclei have been studied. And uh, we have uh, found that there is an RMS to flux relationship, which spans not only during our uh, observations with Astrosat, but it actually dates back all the way 20 years back to ASCA observations. And so uh, this sort of indicates the time scales over which this kind of relationship holds. Um, Mercarian 212 is another uh, dual AGM system which has been studied and star formation regions have been studied around this source too. Uh, and many other such systems have also been studied. Um, UV and X-ray observations have been combined to study uh, several AGNs. Um, this uh, source shows a curved spectrum and we are seeing this kind of curved spectrum in many such blazars. UVIT doesn't show much variation, but X-ray spectrum does show variation over different epochs. Um, IC4329 is another such object which is being studied. Um, and several such aliens have been studied with both UV 
and optical or UV and X-rays. Uh, her X1 is another neutron star binary, which has been studied in UV and X-rays. And uh, UV now has been modeled to, the disk has, the inner disk has been modeled to be a twisted processing disk, thin disk now. And the cyclotron points have been added to the long-term evolution of the cyclotron energy in the system. Uh, finally, the polarization studies using carbon seeds, see, using the cadmium zinc telluride uh, imager. This capability comes because of the thick detector, and we are able to use the Compton scattered photons and find the polarization for crab and also for 20 of the about 490 GRBs detected all over the sky. Um, uh, to end, uh, it is not only the space segment which gives all these results in uh, uh, using the AstroSat. There is a lot of new development which has happened on the ground segment. And uh, we have several people contributing to it starting from AstroSat proposal processing system uh, to the review committees, the AstroSat time allocation committee, the AstroSat technical committee, the AstroSat uh, science support cell set up in Ayuka, the Indian Space Science Data Center, which handles all the data, the spacecraft operations team, which is at this track, and of course the data comes back to ISSBC verified by the payload operation centers, various payload uh, development uh, institutes, and back to the PI who proposed the observation. Um, I leave you with this last slide. We have observed over 1,400 sources, many of them repeatedly, and uh, we have brought out a special issue of JA, uh, the Journal of Astrophysics and Astronomy, uh, covering many of the results, and I, uh, request many of you who want to know details to go to this journal and look for references therein also. Sincere thanks to all those who made this possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. for covering very vast graph from the historical beginning to overview of the instruments and principles of science being gathered and the work which happens behind the scenes to make it possible. Uh, we will take a few questions. So, perfect. Uh, the audience, you ask me to think of your questions. Um, I don't think I have Professor Abdullah online. So, anyone and uh, ask him to say a few words. Meanwhile, you can think of the questions that you want to ask. Uh, Ruan, if you can hear me, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, 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 sir. yes. We are able to see you and yeah. hear. Yeah, I just want to make a few remarks, very brief remarks. One is that, uh, of course, I also acknowledge grateful thanks to the Present SI, an executive council of SI member, and uh, the Ajit Kemba and his wife are stood in this award. I just want to emphasize that this award has been given for Team Astrosat. So, what does it signify? See, Astrosat was culmination of efforts of about 100 scientists, engineers, and technicians at TFR, IAA, and other institutions, as well as about 100 engineers from various ISRO centers, like Euro Space Center, Satellite Center, Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, and so on, okay? And they contributed directly, not only to the making the satellite and subsystem, but also to many of the payloads, some of payloads. So therefore, it's not a single person who is, one group is responsible for its uh, design, development, and realization, a huge team was involved, which is appropriate that the award is given for teamwork. I want to also acknowledge, because that probably many people may not know, that when I first made the proposal, very brief one, maybe 10 pages, to Dr. Kasurangan, who was then chairman, so he very enthusiastically received it 
and he immediately called me the next day and said that he would like broader expert the broader smoke the community to be involved in the, in the new satellite so therefore we convened a meeting at the third quarter in which 25 seismos participated proposals were made and ultimately led to the evolution of the concept of suze it was so it was deliberated for a period of 3 to 4 years finally it proposed a formal proposal uh, and suze was submitted to isro in may 2000 it was approved by the space commission for development in december 2000 approved by the government of india for project mode in 2004 and finally launched in 2015 september 2015 2015 so it was a very hard and dedicated effort of the entire sat team and if you want to make a, a satellite like astrosat an instrument like astrosat then you should be prepared to give over two decades of your life to that so i just want to remind people that is is to say like instruments take years of one's life and so people should be ready for that kind of education thank you thank you so much professor akbar so we are now open for questions please raise your hand and i will come to you with the mic Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm sure there has been hard to work with astronomers outside this community who are not used to the way life is like. But I'm sure that we also appreciate the results that are coming out of this new thing. Sure. Where scientists outside have been very, very significant. What do you take away from this in terms of the future of these missions that it shows the mission in terms of involving the outside community or outside of the community? Okay. Uh, mm. First, yes, it has been. Uh, um, I should say, ISRO has been involved, especially with PFR and PRL, for a very long, long time, right from rocket observations, I suppose. But uh, yes, this was the first time we were involved with many institutions, and uh, ISRO really appreciates that to a large extent. And I think the scientific community has also appreciated the. um advantages isro brings in for launching such missions um having said that yes the way of working the um, the way we even think is different uh but if we want to do science missions competitive science missions i think we have it's my opinion that we have to go this way we cannot have it um, secluded to one or two organizations we have to make it open to many many more players in the field so that we bring in lot of expert different types of expertise into space missions this is my opinion and yes we have to learn to work with each other Sir, yeah, please go ahead. One more question. So, first of all, thank you, Team Astrosat, for giving us such a fabulous mission. Uh, what I wanted to know is that if you are having any follow-up mission on this, like any Astrosat to some kind of another thing. Okay. Ah, uh, we have had discussions. Um, uh, even starting before the launch of Astrosat on. what should be beyond astrosat 
Um, now there are proposals that uh, uh, we should follow up now the polarization part of studies of many of these bright sources. There is already an approved satellite called Exposat to study polarization. However, that is a limited uh, polarization study because it is it will study mainly about two dozen sources uh, in a particular energy range. Uh, the plan is to extend this energy range to both on the soft side and on the hard side. So there is a proposal which is being worked out, the details are being worked out, and probably that will be what is called, what you may call astrosat 2, but we don't want to name things the same way. We will, we might have many more missions even before astrosat 2. Astrosat 2. Thank you so much, Dr. Sita. So, uh, time now to move on to the next lecture to be given by the Justice Oak Awarding for the year 2021. That's Dr. Swagat Saurav Mishra. Uh, Swagat, I request you to share your screen and come online here. Yeah. Hello. I hope I am audible. Yes, you are. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Perfect. And you, you can see your screen as well. Uh, if you want to switch on your camera, you're welcome. You're ready to start. Super. So, uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I guess it's noon time in India and uh, very early morning here in UK. Um, I'm Swagat, and I, I can't uh, tell how honored I am to be speaking to you today. I wish I was there uh, in person, but uh, given the circumstances, I'm, I'm going to deliver an online talk. <clears throat> so this talk is about my uh, PhD thesis, uh, which is uh, titled uh, Some Aspects of the Accelerating Universe from inflation to dark energy. And there was a short introduction uh, or, or reading uh, or citation of uh, this award previously, but I'll just show for, for one minute that this is a thesis in theoretical cosmology, astrophysics or physics under the supervision of Professor Varun Sahani at Ayuka, uh, which, which was defended in last July. And I am really grateful to uh, Astronomical Society of India for, for, for this honor of, of my thesis. <clears throat> so let's uh, get started. Uh, I will start with a short introduction to our universe. Uh, our universe is pretty big. It is quite old and it is expanding. And it's expanding at least for the last 13.8 billion years. Okay. Um, the expansion is usually uh, written in terms of a scale factor. So the space is really expanding and the rate of expansion is called the Hubble parallax. Uh, while the universe is expanding for the, uh, at least for the last 13.8 billion years, uh, there is structure in the universe, which was very low in the beginning. Universe was very homogeneous and isotropic and slowly the structure has grown because of gravitational instability. So it's a very evolving universe. But what is important for this talk is that the universe seems to be accelerating also. In the sense, the expansion rate is uh, speeding up with time. Uh, and that seems to be happening twice. Uh, once in the very early universe, when uh, much before uh, the so-called hot Big Bang phase, that, that's what we call cosmic inflation. And the second one is closer to the present day, in the present epoch, the universe is uh, again accelerating. And uh, we call it uh, dark energy domination. Okay, And this thesis is a study of the accelerating epoch of universe, so it, it focuses on both the early time acceleration and the late time acceleration. Uh, cosmology is, over the past several years has become a precision science and we have a plethora of uh, observational data uh, ranging from cosmic microwave background to the large scale structure of the universe. And that has sort of uh, resulted in a, in a sort of a standard model in cosmology, it is not quite there but it is it is the general picture is uh, is uh, is almost established and uh, it's in the form of a flat lambda cd model and this model 
has several assumptions. Uh, there are a few assumptions about the initial conditions. You can think of it as the initial conditions for the hot Big Bang universe. Uh, that to start with, universe was very, very homogeneous and isotropic over huge landscapes. Okay. And uh, uh, space curvature of the universe is almost negligible. So it's a very flat Euclidean kind of space to start with. And already in the beginning, there were some tiny density fluctuations present, which were very precise. They were very, very Gaussian. They're adiabatic in the sense of fluctuations in, in matter, in radiation, in all sorts of components are kind of similar. And, and uh, if you assume these initial conditions, on top of that, you do two more assumptions that uh, apart from all the familiar matter that we know of from standard model of particle physics, uh, which we, in, 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 we loosely call in astrophysics and cosmology as baryons, energy components, uh, I'm sorry for the disturbance. And uh, uh, that's called dark matter and uh, dark energy. So if you assume that given the initial conditions, and if you assume that you have this kind of composition, this flat lambda CD model, which is standard model of cosmology, is able to explain uh, the evolution, uh, both in the background as well as in the growth of structure level, very, very successfully. So it's a very successful theory. However, I mentioned to you this initial conditions and uh, the initial conditions are in some, in some sense pretty unnatural. And most of the physicists think that this is unlikely that the universe could start in this way. So to address this unnatural problem, it seems that universe did not start like that way. That's just one phase that uh, we have been seeing. Before this phase, there was something in the universe. And the leading hypothesis is that universe went through a short period of very rapid exponential accelerated expansion prior to the time when it, it was about one second old. So much before when it was one second old. Okay. So universe expanded in an accelerated way. And this expansion is called cosmic inflation because of the rapidity of the expansion. And uh, this cosmic inflation sets natural initial conditions for the hot Big Bang phase. Okay. <clears throat> so if I show you overall what is the what we know from this standard model of cosmology or lambda CDM model. Uh, this model, what I show here is the density changing as a function of the size of the universe. And this model uh, incorporates radiation like photons and neutrinos. And it has matter, which are baryonic matter as well as dark matter. And it has a cosmological constant as a dark energy whose energy density is constant all the time. And it is taking over today to give us an accelerated expansion. However, cosmic inflation happened much before this phase. Uh, so it, 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 we don't know when it happened, but we have uh, very strong experimental evidences that it happened. So the standard story goes as there was inflation. We don't know even if whether that's a beginning or not, but there was, there was strong evidence that there was in cosmic inflation. Then universe made a transition from that accelerating inflating phase to the standard hot Big Bang radiation dominated phase through a process called reheating. And slowly it evolved over the years. And that today we see the universe with clumped with galaxies and stars and so on. So if we want to have uh, accelerated expansion in the very early universe, what would make, make space expand acceleratedly? Usually gravity is attractive. So the expansion rate of space should decrease with time. But here during inflation, it is increasing. So if you, are, if you have to trust Einstein's theory of gravity all the way until the early universe, then it tells us that universe has to be filled with a negative pressure substance. So it's a substance which, as it grows, uh, it, it, it's, its energy sort of increases rather than decreasing. Okay. Uh, the dark energy that, that we have today, which we have observed observationally pretty solidly, also has similar property. So negative pressure substance even though in our day-to-day -day life in, on Earth is a esoteric object, uh, it is a very fundamental property of space. In fact, the vacuum energy of space uh, acts like a negative pressure substance, okay? So we need to fill the space with the negative pressure substance and this substance would uh, uh, inflate the universe by e to the power 60 or e to the power 70 times within a fraction of a second before it decayed into all the radiation and matter and then starts your hot Big Bang 
or the classic Big Bang theory. Okay. So we need 60 to 70 E foldings of inflation. So space expands by e to the power 60, 70 times. Then we are set. Okay. Now, usually when we talk about inflationary cosmology in the early universe, it has two aspects. The first aspect has to do with the background expansion of space, which is accelerated expansion, as I talked. This solves the horizon problem and the flatness problem. In the sense, it makes universe very, very homogeneous in the beginning, and it makes the, the geometry, the spatial geometry of the universe as a Euclidean geometry. However, uh, since inflation happened at very early times, it's a very high energy phenomenon, and there are quantum fluctuations in the early universe. And the quantum fluctuations in an accelerated space has a very special behavior. And this behavior seeds this exact Gaussian adiabatic, almost scale invariant density fluctuations in the beginning, which are the origin of all structure in the universe, including large scale structure, including galaxy clusters and so on. Okay. So that's the story, both background and linear fluctuations. Now in the background, uh, to, ex to expand the universe accelerated, you have to fill the universe in some kind of field, which is called a scalar field. Um, a scalar field is again, something which is, you don't see uh, a fundamental scalar field you don't see in, on earth day to day life, but it's a very fundamental thing in physics. We have seen it in lab through, let's say Higgs field. So you have the scalar field in the early universe and uh, it's filling of the space. The in total energy of a scalar field is a combination of how the field is changing everywhere. So it's kinetic energy, as well as what is the potential energy or the energy density of the field uh, at a particular point. Okay. So total energy density is a combination of both of them. And the pressure is a, is a kinetic energy minus potential energy. So it can easily have a negative pressure, basically. So it's a natural candidate to have negative pressure in, in, in physics. Okay. And what happens as time goes on, the scalar field value changes with time because of the gradient of the potential, it go, tends to go towards the center of the potential, but the expansion of the universe acts like a friction term. So this is just a damped harmonic oscillator kind of uh, equation. So it slows down and it moves slowly. Now it turns out in Einstein's theory of gravity, to have acceleration caused by a scalar field, all you need is the kinetic energy to be smaller than the potential energy, okay? And uh, as you saw, this uh, sort of friction term guarantees it and it moves slowly here and the universe keeps accelerating. At some point of time, it starts moving faster and acceleration is over. And then it oscillates and oscillating fields decay in physics. So this field will decay into all sorts of degrees of freedom. They will interact and thermalize and give rise to the hot peak time. Okay. So usually this, this characteristic that our universe can accelerate is equivalent to, we say, in terms of a parameter, we call it epsilon, or the slow roll parameter, and it should be smaller than one. To have correct initial conditions for the Big Bang, we also need uh, uh, inflation to last longer, e to the power 70 times. So we don't want the inflaton field to speed up very fast. So it will move slowly. That's why we also have a, another condition. So we have two conditions on the field, uh, and if that is satisfied, we get inflation. And you might think these are very special conditions. It turns out oh, uh, uh, from the analysis over the years, including some of the analysis done by my work during my PhD, that this is a very natural state. And in fact, if you have a scalar field in the early universe, it is very difficult not to inflate. So most of the time it will inflate and it will go to something what we call a slow roll regime, where it will move really slowly. Okay. And such a slow roll motion of a scalar field is exactly equivalent to like a cosmological constant, which is slowly changing over the time. And it makes the space expand exponentially. And th this is how we get inflation. So once the space expands exponentially for a while, you get a very homogeneous universe with a Euclidean geometry. So the background problems are solved easily. Uh, but what about the fluctuations which are present in the universe? Well, uh, because of quantum mechanics during uh, inflation, during any accelerated expansion of space, it is guaranteed to have uh, quantum fluctuations to be seen on galactic scales or larger scales, really, in the macroscopic scales. What we have right now um, during inflation is we have gravity, and this gravity is sourced by a scalar field. There may be other fields like normal photons, electrons, all sorts of other fields, 
but they are all diluted away because of the rapid exponential expansion of space. So mostly universe is dominated by scalar field. Now such a system, if you analyze it as a, as a quantum field theoretic system, there are two fields that are guaranteed to exist. It's not like they can exist, they are definitely guaranteed to exist. The first one has to do with how the curvature of overall curvature of space fluctuates from point to point. So there are small tiny fluctuations in homogeneities. The second has to do with the distance between two points. The metric also fluctuates as a tensor. So these two fields are guaranteed. The first field, uh, which is fluctuating, it later becomes all the galaxies and uh, last cluster of galaxies and last scale structure that you see. Okay, So this is the origin of all structure. Then there is a second field, which is a metric fluctuations. And that becomes later in the hot big bang phase as a gravitational waves, which we can detect today. I, I just schematically show what happens during inflation. Uh, the, the horizon of the universe is kind of constant. And because of uh, sort of exponential expansion of space, all these fluctuation wavelengths, if you think of as a Fourier mode made up of several frequencies, each frequency sort of gets out of the horizon during inflation. And once they go outside the horizon, they are constant, which doesn't happen in a static space like Minkowski space in this room. You don't see quantum fluctuations because they are very tiny and only at small scale doing experiments like Casimir effect, you can see them. But during inflation, they are stretched to very, very large scale, super Hubble scales outside the Hubble radius they are put. And after inflation, they enter the Hubble radius. And after they enter, they gravitationally clump systems. And that's how we form structure in the universe today. So without these fluctuations, we will not have any structure. Universe will be a diffused hydrogen and helium gas. Okay. Now these are uh, not just qualitative statements. Uh, you can quantify the exact structure of these fluctuations, in particular the power spectrums. The power spectrum of uh, the scalar fluctuations, which will become density fluctuations later, is a power law. So it has an amplitude, and with frequency, it goes as a power law. The same also happens to the tensor fluctuations. And the amplitude of scalar and tensor fluctuations are dependent on the Hubble radius during uh, inflation. So it depends on the expansion rate during inflation. And the tilt, or what we call the spectral index, they are dependent on these slow roll parameters that I told you. That has to do with how slowly this field was changing over time. Okay. And uh, you can test these predictions uh, with CMB because cosmic microwave background observations have fluctuations and we are claiming that these fluctuations come from inflation so we can test and check these predictions. Over the last several uh, decades, CMB has become a very precise science. It can measure fluctuations over very small angular scales up to one arc minute. And uh, we can just calculate several correlation functions of these fluctuations, the autocorrelation function or the variance the three point correlation function and so on. There are two important quantities uh, that we observed. One is the tensor to scalar ratio. It means the ratio of metric fluctuation divided by the ratio of this density fluctuation. So you can think of gravitational waves divided by density fluctuations. And that we can check against the density tilt. So as, as you go to the small, small scales, how the, the amplitude of fluctuation change. And we have a data which lies here in this place. So as you can see, this is a very highly constrained system. There is an upper bound on how much gravitational waves you can have. And there is both an upper and lower bound on the spectral index. So this spectral index has been one of the best measure quantities in all of astrophysics and cosmology. Okay. And there are several theoretical models which tells what is the shape of this inflaton potential, this self interaction potential of the field. And depending on the shape, you have different predictions. And you can see already a lot of things are outside the data and they're completely ruled out. This is the new data from 2021. <clears throat> but there are again several shapes which satisfies the data. What particularly satisfies is that a potential which sort of becomes flat and we call it asymptotically flat potential. Okay, such potential satisfy the data very well. So we are very sure. And this is, this is a process which is happening around 10 to the power 16 GV or so. We can never test them in laboratory, but we can test them in the sky by looking at how CMB fluctuations are there and how galaxies are clustered, basically. However, 
CMB only, uh, as well as large scale structure, only see a small window of the inflationary dynamics. Uh, they can see from the all over the sky, so 180 degree, all the way to one arc minute. That, that only covers about seven to eight e folds of expansion during inflation. The rest of the expansion, about uh, 50 e folds, e to the power 50 times, is not explored by observation so far. So that is one aspect that my theory, uh, my PhD thesis actually sort of explored. How do we know this uh, uh, primordial dynamics at small scales? The second uh, unexplored thing or less explored thing is actually the initial conditions that how did this inflation begin to start with in general? So that's called initial conditions for inflation. That also was a part studied in my thesis. And the third thing is, what is the origin of all matter in the universe? All electrons, all photons. So this inflaton field basically decays into all matter and that process is called reheating and that is also studied in this thesis. So I initially I talked, uh, tried to uh, sort of uh, develop the area. Then now I'll kind of quickly go over the work that was done in the thesis. I'll just briefly mention everything and I won't uh, extend for too long. Okay, the first thing that was explored was initial conditions for inflation. And what we found that if the shape of the potential is uh, like a quadratic potential or a simple harmonic potential, then if you start close to the center, you don't get inflation. So that's what is red. And if you start away from the center, you actually get inflation. So initially, we don't know how the scalar field came in the universe, but if initially the field value was here, you don't get inflation. Okay. And what we found is for 99.99% of the initial conditions, you get inflation. So you have to fine tune your initial condition not to get inflation, which was a great thing. But this was also well known before. What is completely new in our analysis is that these potentials are now ruled out by observation. Uh, what are favored are these asymptotically flat potentials very much. And in these potentials, even starting from the center, you can get a lot of inflation as well as starting far away. So here, even more, several 99.9% initial conditions give you inflation. Uh, so this was one of the key findings. Uh, this work on initial conditions cons consisted of two papers, actually. Um, the second one was slightly uh, more on the technical side. The first, wo first one uh, was slightly more on the dynamic side. So I showed a little bit of the first uh, result. So we have to just understand that if the universe had a scalar field in the early universe, most of the time it's going to inflate. So inflation is a natural phenomenon. That's ignoring initial positive curvature. Okay, that's a cap. Okay. Uh, second thing, so this, so this is fairly well established now that general, general initial conditions. The second one has to do with uh, the small scale structure. How do we study? We don't see it with large, uh, with, uh, large scale structure observations and CMB. Here is a power spectrum of primordial fluctuations, primordial density fluctuations as a function of the frequency. This is the origin. These fluctuations are the origin of all structure in the universe. And from CMB and Lyman alpha observations, they are pretty well constrained here when the frequency is low or the angular scales are high. But on smaller scales for large part of the parameter space, there, there are no constraints at all. So anything can happen here. In particular, the fluctuation power, rather than becoming smaller or remaining almost scale invariant, it can get amplified. And if it gets amplified, such large fluctuations can immediately collapse in the early universe to form black holes, which we call primordial black holes. The mechanism is the following. In the CMB window, we have small fluctuations. They are frozen outside the Hubble radius all the while and much later they enter the Hubble radius. As they enter, they compress matter and form galaxies and large scale structure. At small scales, there may be large fluctuations. And when they enter, they form primordial black holes basically. So they, they form because of immediate gravitational collapse. So they're formed very early in the universe in the hot Big Bang phase. So since black holes can have interesting, uh, you can prove black holes uh, more, more easily, so they, they are a great observational probe of the very early universe at small scales. Okay. Now it turns out, how, how do we have these large fluctuations? It turns out inflation can create large fluctuations. 
So rather than having this asymptotically flat potential becoming smooth, at some point it can become even flatter. So the potential can deviate and become even flatter. A very flat potential has almost zero gradient. So it is so the scalar field is moving purely by friction, which is given by the expansion of the universe. So the scalar field slows down a lot. A very slowly moving scalar field has large quantum fluctuations. So these large fluctuations are produced in, in this mechanism. So what we call that the scalar field goes from a slow roll to an ultra slow roll for a while, and again back to slow roll and then inflation ends. If that happens, you will have primordial black holes. Now, up until I did my thesis, uh, most of the work on primordial black holes focused on this particular flat feature known as the inflection point feature. These features are sort of intermingled into the infl inflation potential. And if you want to form big black holes, let's say LIGO and Virgo are observing big black holes. Such black holes, to form big black holes, this feature should be closer to the CMB, to the, to the part where CMB fluctuations were created. And that will distort CMB fluctuations completely, and that will not explain the structure today. So those are not possible in this uh, kind of features. So after a lot of uh, thinking, we actually introduced a new feature into inflaton potential. And this feature in, is in terms of a tiny bump. And this bump has, uh, uh, has none of the disadvantage as the previous feature. And you can produce really big black holes uh, as well as small black holes. And the structure of the potential, the way we introduced in the paper, has a base potential, which is a standard potential used in physics, uh, as asymptotically flat potential, with a small exp correction, epsilon. This epsilon is a we think of it as a tiny bump. It has a small height and a small width, okay? And in the paper, we, we played with several kind of base potentials and several kind of bumps, all of them yielded in uh, formation of primordial black holes at small scales. This is just a demonstration. By the way, it, it doesn't have to be a bump. It can also be a dip. Either a bump or a dip can form black holes. And you see the power spectrum, which could have gone like almost scale invariant, gone like this black line has a huge amplification by the order of 10 to the power seven, which, which form black holes basically. This is based on this work, which actually gained some uh, media attention and it was featured on Astrobyte also uh, in, in 2020. Okay, so quickly. <clears throat> so so that, that's the work on the small scale structure. There are other problems. How do we know what is the actual physics during inflation? There are many models which predict the same observational quantities. So this is called degeneracy. In a, in, a, in a work, we showed that this degeneracy can be broken if you think of what happens after inflation ends. So how universe exactly reheats. In particular, what was the equation of state of the universe just after, after reheating? Okay, what is the, uh, just after inflation? At what rate space was expanding after inflation? We don't know. It took a while from after inflation to the hot Big Bang phase of radiation domination. So that phase is reheating. So we took into account some of the constraints that we know of different models of reheating and we put those constraints and we show in this work that actually some of the degeneracies uh, that are there can be broken. Uh, and we also demonstrated that uh, what was happening during reheating can be easily tested using gravitational waves. This is not gravitational waves from a particular event, but this is the overall stochastic background gravitational waves, which will be measured in future, let's say by Big Bang Observer. And depending on what was happening on reheating, it has a different uh, spectral index. Okay. So this, these gravitational waves observations are going to be one of the most important observations of early universe in the future. Okay, uh, so this was uh, one of my last papers in, in PhD. I, I'll rush, I have only two slides, I think. <clears throat> uh, so now, I talked to you about the early acceleration phase of the universe. What are the unknowns in this field and what we contributed during my PhD? Now I'm going to talk about the late universe, which is dark energy. So here in the standard Lambda CDM model, you have a cosmological constant. It's very small at early times, but it sort of dominates at towards the present epoch and makes the universe accelerate again. And we have observed this both through CMB as well as through supernova data. However, this cosmological constant has several theoretical problems. Uh, most of them have to do with the fact that this is a perfect constant. And hence, it is uh, desirable that we have a evolving cosmological constant 
uh, with changes over time and uh, that people put forward several uh, ideas coming from different theories of physics there is one of one idea was that uh, the uh, potential has 1 by 5 to the power p so inverse power law potential this evolves with time this is the uh, red is the dark energy which evolves with time however you can start with different values of dark energy they all come and converge onto one so it has an attractor trajectory which is very nice so for a large range of initial condition we get today's value of dark energy however given data we have measured the equation of star, uh, state of dark energy very well from the data and given such constraints uh, this initial basin of attraction actually shrinks a lot and this interesting attractive property is actually destroyed somewhat there is another thing that people introduce which is called exponential potential which is like a chameleon in some sense during radiation domination it behaves like radiation during matter domination it behaves like matter but that's all it doesn't lead to a dark energy domination so so some modification of this potential is required so we introduce in a paper four new potentials uh, which call new tracker models of dark energy which get around all these problems all this potential has the feature that at early times uh, the dark energy is evolving rapidly and it has an attractive behavior so you can start with different values and it comes to the same value eventually and at late times it behaves like a cosmological constant okay so, th so th th this was a this was a work that we did in 2017 uh, and it's very interesting that in the last two years a lot of people are testing all, each of our models especially this model was tested uh, in december in a, in a new paper and it favors the data over many other models actually so that's interesting to see the more and more people who do data testing are testing these models observationally okay uh, i had uh, three more papers uh, during my phd but i because of the shortage of time i did not discuss them some of them have to do with unification of dark matter and dark energy and some of them have to do with dark energy itself and one of them had to do with dark matter. Now let me go to the summary or the outlook uh, part of my talk. <clears throat> so cosmology is uh, clearly a precision science in 21st century where we are measuring quantities up to 1% uh, precision from, from observations. And uh, in the next generation, there are, there are going to be even better observations, uh, especially for dark energy. There will be several missions and both Earth-based and space-based for dark matter. Uh, there will be new CMB obs observatories like CMB Stage 4, Lightbird, SPT, Simon Observatory. And there is also some idea of uh, CMB Varad, which will look at uh, the metric fluctuations, which cause polarization of the CMB light. And that is very important because it is like a, it's like really colliding particles and seeing their energy but not in the sky, not, uh, not in the lab. And more, most importantly, there will be gravitational waves observatories and uh, which can cover all of them. Uh, dark matter, primordial black holes, inflation, and maybe Hubble tension, which is uh, there nowadays. Uh, some uh, acknowledgements. Uh, I'm, I'm really uh, grateful to my wonderful PhD supervisor, Professor Varun Chani, with whom I had a great time during my PhD discussing several things about physics and uh, my collaborators during my PhD, uh, all IUCA faculty members and a lot of colleagues, friends and students who helped me a lot during my, my thesis. Uh, I want to uh, dedicate this award to my supervisor, to IUCA and to my parents. I leave you with this, uh, this quote from Feynman. Thanks. Sorry if I overshoot by a few minutes. I didn't know, uh, notice. That's all right. Thanks for giving us an overview of your work and also placing it in context of uh, the larger picture. Yeah. So in view of uh, the fact that we are running a bit late, I'm sorry, we'll not take any questions right now, but I urge the audience to put the questions in the chat box. And sort of I request you to uh, see if anything shows up there and respond to them. If you, could take, if you could take the questions in the chat box. Sure, sure. I, I don't mind. So that, uh, Thanks. Okay. So a couple of announcements. As you know, uh, this is the end of this particular award session. Right. For the next session, we meet at the other venue, the LHC2.